Connie considered herself lucky to have such a mother-in-law. She heard countless stories from her close friend Heather, who was constantly tormented by her husband's mother, and all she could do was sigh in disbelief. Just imagine, Heather said, her eyes wide with indignation, my mother-in-law used to visit us unannounced as a surprise, and as soon as she entered the house, she would immediately check if the rooms were clean. She even used a white tissue to check under the bed. If she found even a speck of dust, she would run up to me, pointing her finger in my face and shout, What a shame! You haven't vacuumed in a year! And that's not all. Then she would rush into the kitchen to inspect everything, opening the refrigerator and loudly exclaiming, How old is this soup? Did you make it yesterday? Are you crazy? Tom should only eat fresh food! Heather imitated her mother-in-law in a nasty high-pitched voice. Despite the overall horror of the situation, it was impossible not to laugh. After that, she would meticulously inspect the bathroom and toilet, making sure the toilet bowl was spotless, the towels were snow white, and then she would check how her beloved Tom's shirts were hung in the closet, making sure that they were properly ironed. Heather continued, What a nightmare, Connie sighed, relieved in her heart that she was incredibly lucky with her own mother-in-law. Not even in her worst dreams could Connie imagine Florence raising her voice at her or saying anything rude or impolite. Her mother-in-law was always surprisingly delicate and tactful. She never pressured Connie about grandchildren, even though Connie's own mother would constantly bring up the topic. Connie, when are you and Robert going to have children? It's about time. I want to babysit my grandchildren. At family celebrations and gatherings, Numerous relatives, aunts, great-aunts, and grandmothers of distant relatives would also press Connie, without any hesitation in their comments. Connie, when are you going to get pregnant? You're not getting any younger. How old are you? Twenty-seven? I already have my third child at your age. Connie always forced a smile and mumbled some unintelligible response. Questions about when she and her husband would have children always hurt her, it had been five years since their wedding day, and there were still no children. And it wasn't because they didn't want them. They did. They just couldn't. Every month, Connie prayed that this time it would work, but she was always disappointed. After numerous tests and examinations, she was diagnosed with a rather serious condition that made it impossible for her to conceive. Connie was afraid that Robert would leave her, that one day she would become a burden to him, and that he would want his own child from another healthy woman. Of course, her husband reassured her that he loved her more than anything, and that having children, or not, didn't matter to him. However, Connie felt insecure and considered herself an inferior woman. Connie's mother-in-law, Florence, was a model of tact. She affectionately inquired after Connie's well-being, but never intruded with her innermost thoughts or made any inappropriate remarks, unsolicited advice, or uncomfortable questions. For this, Connie had a great respect and appreciation for her mother-in-law. She had never encountered a more benevolent and honourable person, and it seemed that Florence referred to Connie as her own daughter, and always cared for her as much as she did for her own son. Whenever Robert and Connie visited her, Florence greeted them with a warm smile, and a table filled with delicious food. However, in the past months, Connie noticed that the woman, while still setting the table as usual, appeared incredibly fatigued and worn out, as if cooking had drained all her energy. Florence, Connie said to her, you don't have to work so hard for us. Standing at the stove for half the day tires you out. Don't make such sacrifices. Next time, Please allow us to buy something for tea, and that'll be sufficient. The mother-in-law smiled faintly. Connie, I feel perfectly fine. It brings me so much joy to treat you and Robert to something delicious. Robert also noticed that something was amiss with his mother. Mum had lost a lot of weight. He shared his observations with Connie. Have you noticed it too? She insists everything is fine, while she looks exhausted and unwell. That's just like Mum, Robert sighed. She never admits when she's not feeling well or in pain. Maybe she should get a check-up, 
Connie suggested, to check her blood, heart and other internal organs just to be safe. I hope there's nothing serious going on with her, but it wouldn't hurt to be cautious. Perhaps she's simply exhausted. We should arrange a trip to the seaside for her. It's been so long since she last took a vacation, Robert proposed. Good idea, Connie nodded. However, when Florence heard about the plan to send her to the sea, she resisted and weakly argued, Oh, are you crazy? I'm not going anywhere. I have my garden, my chickens and my cat. They all depend on me. Who will take care of them if I leave? Don't worry. We'll take care of your vegetable garden and animals. Robert reassured her. I'll drop by after work. Connie will help and if needed, we can ask your neighbour to help. Florence's neighbour was a young girl in her early twenties named Julie. She was an orphan who had been raised by her grandparents and they had passed away a year ago, leaving her all alone. Julie occasionally visited Florence to assist her or simply have a chat. Julie won't refuse to help. Florence's face brightened upon hearing about her neighbour. I'll talk to her. If she agrees, then I'll go to the seaside. To be frank, Connie didn't particularly like her mother-in-law's neighbour. The girl always smiled timidly and shyly, behaving like an uncomplaining sheep, but deep in her heart, Connie knew what bothered her the most about the neighbour. It wasn't her modesty or her doll-like face with submissive eyes. Connie suspected that Julie had been hopelessly in love with Robert for a long time. Once, she shared her suspicions with her husband, but he only snorted derisively. Who? Julie? Come on, what love is there? I remember her as a snotty little girl, always following me when I went out with the boys. She's ten years younger than me. I never thought of her as a girl, more like a little sister. Connie pressed her lips together and said nothing, but she thought to herself that Julie's childhood was over long ago, and she was no longer a teenager, but an adult pretty woman. However, Connie had no reason not to trust her husband. If he said that he did not perceive Julie as a girl, then it must be true. Florence was delighted with the seaside vacation. What a turquoise and clear sea in the morning. It's so gentle and warm. The grapes, straight from the bush, are incredibly tasty, and the ripe peaches are so juicy. The wave brings such beautiful shells to the shore. The woman shared her joy when Connie and Robert called her. It seems the trip did your mother good, Connie remarked with a smile. Even through the video link, you can see that her face is literally glowing with happiness. She looks fresher and more beautiful. Well, I told you that everything would get better if she just got some good rest, Robert confirmed with satisfaction. On the eve of her mother-in-law's arrival, Connie decided to clean the house. Florence hadn't requested it, but of course, it was much nicer to come back to a clean house. When Connie opened the door, with the spare set of keys, she discovered that everything inside had been cleaned. And there was not just clean, but sparkling clean in the house. The doormats were washed and fresh. The furniture surfaces were free of any dust. In the kitchen, the dishes sparkled. The tablecloth was starched and crisp. And the bed linen was snow white, ironed and fragrant with a refreshing conditioner. Connie looked at all this in amazement and immediately answered, herself the question of who had done this. Of course, it was Julie. Although she should have been grateful to the girl, Connie felt a slight irritation. Why is she trying so hard, as if she wants to please Florence? She thought with annoyance. Robert is already taken away. Does she hope that one day he will pay her any attention? Connie went out into the yard to check on the chickens. Everything was in order. The birds were fed and watered and in the vegetable garden, everything was well maintained with no weeds. Even the beds had been watered. Against her will, Connie felt another twinge of irritation. Look how diligent Julie is. She is like a fairy. Subconsciously, Connie didn't fully trust the girl, as she sensed a sneering squint behind her meek gaze and huge blue eyes. However, she was still grateful for her help. To meet Florence at the airport, 
Connie and Robert went together and carefully searched for a familiar, slim figure in the crowd of arrivals. There she is, Connie exclaimed joyfully, being the first to spot Florence and waved her hand. The woman approached them with a smile, pulling her small, wheeled suitcase behind her. Robert and Connie rushed to hug and kiss her, and then something terrible happened right before their eyes. Florence suddenly groaned and turned pale, and before Robert could react, she slowly collapsed to the floor like a lifeless doll. Robert rushed to his mother and managed to catch her just in time before she hit the ground. As soon as possible, Florence was delivered to the hospital. Robert, I'm fine, his mother reassured him in a weak voice lying on a stretcher. Just fatigue, a change of climate, it'll pass. Take me home, please. Oh, no, Connie and Robert objected in unison. No home, until we know exactly what's happening to you. We're not going home. A series of endless tests and examinations dragged on. Connie was afraid of something serious, but she did not admit it to Robert, so as not to worry him in vain. However, the diagnosis still sounded like a thunderclap to both of them. I'm sorry, the doctor said, turning to Robert. Your mother has cancer. Cancer? He questioned the man inanely and squeezed Connie's palm harder, as if he were looking to her for protection. Mum has cancer. That means she's going to die? What are you saying, Robert? Connie was as shocked as her husband. Cancer is not a verdict, is it? She turned to the doctor for support. The doctor shrugged his shoulders uncertainly, apparently not wanting to reassure in vain, but he wasn't going to scare her in vain either. There's always a chance, he said evasively. Surgery, chemotherapy, I assure you we'll do our best, but unfortunately it's not always up to us. After the doctors leaving the couple, Connie said, We should probably stop by Florence's house and get some things for her for the hospital. You know, a change of underwear, a robe, slippers, a toothbrush, a comb, and so on. Yes, of course, Robert nodded. Let's get going now. You'll help me pack everything so I don't forget anything. At Florence's house, Connie quickly found the required items and put them in a bag. Her husband had been sitting on a stool in the kitchen all this time, staring blankly at the wall. "'I don't believe Mum can die,' he said at last. His lips quivered like a hurt child's. "'I don't want her to die!' Connie rushed to her husband and hugged him tightly, pressing his head against her breast. "'She won't die,' she whispered fervently, covering his tear-stained cheeks with kisses. "'She'll get help!' Surgery will fix everything, I believe it. And her husband continued to shake with silent sobs. Connie, I can't go to her today. I'll burst into tears as soon as I look at her. Couldn't you bring her things yourself? I'm afraid today. Today I can't stand it, and I'll ruin everything. I need some time to realize everything. Of course, darling, Connie nodded. I'll go to the hospital myself. You really need to calm down a bit and come to your senses. Thank you, Connie, he said, pressing her palms to his lips. What would I do without you? She picked up the bag of belongings and inquired, Are you going home now? Robert shook his head slowly. No, I want to sit here in my mum's alone for a while and think about everything. I need this, Connie, just to be alone for a while and process everything. Of course, she said softly. I understand. Stay here as long as you need to. I'll go straight home after the hospital and wait for you there. Call me if you need anything. If Connie could have known what would happen at her mother-in-law's house after she left, she would never have left Robert alone. The mother-in-law tried to remain calm. There's no need to worry. The doctors are very experienced here and have a golden hand, Connie assured her, putting on an overly cheerful tone. They'll operate and you'll be as good as new. Here are your things for now, and if needed I'll bring more. 
Florence asked weakly. Where's Robert? He had to rush away on business. He promised to come and see you tomorrow, Connie lied. Now try to rest and get some sleep. Tomorrow both Robert and I will definitely come and bring you something delicious. When Connie returned home, her husband still hadn't arrived. He was probably still at his mother's house. The woman didn't bother him with calls, deciding to prepare something tasty and nutritious for her mother-in-law. The hospital provided food, of course, but it couldn't compare to home-cooked meals. As Connie worked in the kitchen, washing, peeling and cutting vegetables, and cooking chicken broth, time flew by, and her worries subsided. However, evening came, dinner was ready, and Robert still hadn't returned. Connie hesitated and sent him a message. Where are you? He didn't immediately respond. I'm still at my mum's house. Should I expect you for dinner? The message was read, but this time Robert remained silent for a very, very long time. Finally, he wrote, I want to stay here for now. Have dinner and go to bed without me. I'll be home late. Good night. Trying not to show her disappointment, Connie wished him a good night too and sighed. She didn't feel like eating alone. She tossed and turned in bed for a long time, feeling its emptiness and coldness without her husband. Sleep finally washed over her. Connie fell into a deep slumber and only woke up when she heard the sound of the key turning in the lock. She jumped out of bed, but what time is it? Connie looked at the clock and couldn't contain her surprise. Wow, it's eight o'clock in the morning. So Robert didn't sleep at home at all tonight. Quickly throwing on a silk robe, Connie rushed out to meet him and was shocked by what she saw. Robert reeked of alcohol from metres away and he could barely stand on his feet, staggering and clutching onto the walls. Connie had never seen her husband in such a state and it left her incredibly confused. Avoiding eye contact, Robert apologised. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Connie, I don't know how it happened. And suddenly broke down, sliding down the wall to the floor and covering his face with his hands. Connie gently stroked his dishevelled hair. Did you get drunk because of your mum? She asked in a trembling voice. Robert shook his head. I'm a scoundrel. I'm a jerk, Connie. I'm an unforgivable, a real wretch. Why are you blaming yourself so hard? Connie cradled his head against her chest. For a moment it seemed as if her husband's scent was mixed with another woman's perfume. But she quickly dismissed the thought. What nonsense was she thinking? It was probably just her imagination running wild. Your reaction is natural and understandable. You're worried about your mother. Connie comforted him. You have nothing to apologise for. But Robert kept sobbing so bitterly and inconsolably that Connie's heart was literally torn with grief. At that time, she did not know that the reason for his tears was not his mother's illness, but something else. The mother-in-law's operation was successful, and everyone breathed a sigh of relief. However, Robert had subtly changed since the day he came home drunk. Connie couldn't quite pinpoint these changes, but her husband had really become quite different. At times, he seemed like a stranger. It was as if he avoided Connie, avoiding eye contact or guiltily averting his eyes when they did meet. Eventually, Connie couldn't bear it any longer. Why do you look like a delinquent child or a misbehaving cat? She exclaimed, splashing her hands. Something has happened. Nothing's happened. Everything's fine. Her husband glumly muttered. Then why have you become such a stranger? Connie asked in despair. I'm afraid to even approach you sometimes. You're making up nonsense, Robert muttered, turning away again. I'm the same as I was before. Nothing has changed. Connie knew, however, that it had. Since Robert refused to share his real worries with her, Connie didn't bother prying. She only hoped that everything would gradually work itself out and return to normal. Maybe her beloved Robert would become the same as before. However, over time, the changes in her husband worsened. Robert became even more withdrawn, frowning and taciturn. There was a deep wrinkle between his eyebrows, 
He often seemed to be tormented by something, lost in thought and staring at one point. At one point, Connie feared that Robert was as ill as his mother, so she cautiously started a conversation about his well-being. But in response to her anxious inquiries, her husband only snapped, I'm well. I'm perfectly healthy. Don't pluck at me like a hen. Connie took offence and even shed a few tears. Robert, of course, immediately came to his senses, pulled her close and buried his face in her hair, just like before. Forgive me, Connie. I've worn you out. Here he is again, asking for forgiveness, Connie wondered. What is it that oppresses him so? Then she began to notice that Robert was staying late at work more and more often. At first, she didn't think much of it, especially since her husband said he had been at his mother's house. Connie had no reason to suspect him of deceit, and yet these frequent visits to his mother started to worry her. She even started feeling again that Robert smelled of someone else's perfume, and it certainly wasn't Florence's perfume. Connie didn't know what to think. Once, despite despising herself for doing so, she dialed her mother-in-law's number and asked how she was doing, inquiring about her health. Then, as if casually, she asked, By the way, is Robert still at yours? Yes, the mother-in-law replied hesitantly. He's in the vegetable garden now. I asked him to water the flower beds. Did he water the beds yesterday, too? Connie asked, hesitating a bit. And the day before yesterday? And three days ago? And last week? Connie, her mother-in-law said, did Robert hurt you in some way? Connie immediately cooled down. She felt deflated like a balloon that had all the air let out. No, she said. I'm sorry, I'm just being foolish. Of course Robert didn't hurt me, and I'm glad he's helping you. However, as she hung up, Connie pondered deeply. Maybe I should go to my mother-in-law's house myself to see for sure that everything is all right, that Robert is really just helping his mother and not involved with another woman. And so she did. Connie convinced herself that she was only going to see Florence, but deep down she knew that she wanted to make sure her husband and his mother weren't deceiving her. Robert was indeed at his mother's, and Connie witnessed an idyllic scene of a peaceful tea party at her mother-in-law's house. At the table sat Florence herself, Julie, and Robert. At the sight of Connie, all three of them looked embarrassed, as if Connie had witnessed something obscene. Florence tried to overcome from the awkwardness by fussing and chatting lively. Julie lowered her head, pretending to be deeply engrossed in her teacup. As for Robert... He first turned pale, then red, before finally exhaling and asking, What are you doing here? Connie, feeling pathetic and confused, retorted, I stopped by to see how Florence's health is. Do I not have the right to do so? Yes, of course you do, Connie, exclaimed the mother-in-law. My home is your home. You know that very well. However, at the moment... Connie felt like an unwanted and unwelcome guest in this home. Well, I should probably go home, Julie said meekly and sheepishly as she quickly stood up from the table. No one tried to stop her, and as Julie passed by Connie, she caught a familiar scent. Isn't that the perfume that has been lingering around Robert lately? Oh, I'm just being paranoid. Connie silently fumed at herself for suspecting her husband of being involved with that woman. It was ridiculous. After Julie left, the atmosphere became even more unbearable. All three of them, the mother-in-law, Robert and Connie, felt awkward and constrained. Time was passing, week after week, month after month. Florence had to undergo regular examinations at a clinic to prevent a relapse. It was during one of these examinations that they received the devastating news that the disease had returned. It hadn't gone away. It had only been lurking and had now struck with renewed vigour, affecting other organs. The sight of Robert was heartbreaking, and Connie 
could barely hold back her tears upon hearing the doctor's verdict. This time there is no hope. Prepare yourselves. It's a matter of a couple of months, at most six. Telling her mother-in-law was the hardest part, but as it turned out, she had already figured it out. There was nothing to be done except for palliative therapy, to alleviate some of the suffering, but not to cure the woman. The misfortune brought Connie and Robert closer together. Robert sought her support once again, trying to be present for her, and he stopped staying late at work or disappearing in the evenings. Together, they surrounded the sick woman with love and care, and also hired a nurse to take care of Florence around the clock. Forgive me, Connie, the mother-in-law said, not long before she died, when she was so weak that she could barely move her lips. Connie never understood what she was apologising for. The funeral had an unexpectedly large number of people. Plenty of warm words were spoken about her, and many people cried sincerely. It was strange that the obliging Julie, who often spent time with Florence, was not among the mourners. She usually hung around, and now she didn't even come to the funeral. They decided to hold a wake in Florence's house. Connie looked at her mother-in-law's photo in the funeral frame, and rushed out of the room into the kitchen, trying to hold back tears. In the kitchen, two neighbouring women, Mrs. Gonkulves and Mrs. Basie, were engaged in their usual gossip. They didn't notice Connie, who slowed her steps. Suddenly she heard that they were speaking about Robert and Julie. "'Thank God she had the conscience not to attend the funeral,' Mrs. Basie whispered loudly. "'What a snake Julie turned out to be, and she pretended to be so innocent!' It was Florence's own fault. She's been spoiling her too much, Clava said, speaking in a loud whisper. That quiet girl had always been around Robert, ever since she was a child. She was always making eyes at him, but Florence didn't seem to notice anything. Julie was like a saint to her. On the other hand, Florence can be understood, Mrs. Basie said. She wanted grandchildren for a long time, and her daughter-in-law turned out to be unable to give her a grandson or a granddaughter. Yes, she is really unlucky, Mrs. Goncalves said. Of course, Connie is a good woman. She's courteous, kind, but she's empty. And what man would last long with a barren woman? So Robert couldn't stand it. Connie pressed her palms to her mouth. Robert couldn't stand to be near her? He is here in the room sitting at the table. He hasn't gone anywhere. But still, taking a man away from his wife is the most miserable thing, Mrs. Basie said with indignation. How did that wretch woman manage to pull it off? Robert had never paid attention to her since his childhood. Who knows? She could get him drunk and seduce him. Those meek-looking quiet ones are actually impudent lechers. Oh, I felt that behind this angelic Julie's appearance the devil was hiding. Connie was about to burst into the kitchen and resolutely stop that vile gossip about her husband's infidelity, but at that very moment a phrase sounded that made her freeze. And look, what an injustice! Connie can't get pregnant for a long time, and Julie has had twins! Connie clasped her mouth with her palm in shock, holding back the scream that was bursting out of her mouth. Twins! Who's having twins? Is that quiet Julie? But they turned out so cute, so sweet, Mrs. Basie said with a sigh. They look so much like their daddy, but just like two drops of water. Yes, the boy and the girl look just like Robert, Mrs. Goncalves confirmed. I can see why Florence was so happy. She had grandchildren. No matter how well she treats Connie, her own grandchildren will be closer and dearer than the best daughter-in-law. By the way, have you seen Robert? He's completely worn out. His face has darkened. Of course he lost his mother. Such grief. But he's so gloomy because of his children born out of marriage. It's obvious that he loves his wife, but on the other hand can't leave his children. He loves them too. They're his own blood. She continued to stand with her palm pressed to her mouth 
so as not to give herself away by a careless cry or a groan. How painful and sickening it was for her. The truth that had been revealed to her was terrible. It was as if the blinders had fallen from Connie's eyes. She instantly realised the reason for her husband's frequent delays. All those long months, Robert had been deceiving her in cold blood. All this time, he had a mistress on the side, and not just any mistress, but one who had given him what Connie had never been able to give him. I wonder how old his little ones are now, Connie pondered in slow motion. And when did he and Julie start dating? The woman was sure that Robert had been involved with Julie after he had learned of his mother's illness. It was then that he'd changed somehow, cooled toward his wife. Well, so his kids are no more than a few months old now, because they found out about their mother-in-law's diagnosis a little more than a year ago. I wonder if he is ever going to tell me about them, or was he planning to lead a double life like this? Connie suddenly realised that Robert could leave her at any moment. And really, what was keeping him around? A sense of duty? Friendly affection? A long-standing habit? But love must be long gone, because if he truly loved Connie, he could never have had an affair with another woman. And now he has nothing to keep him. In that other family he has the main thing, his daughter and son, if you believe the chatter of the gossiping neighbours. Does that mean everyone knows? Connie felt a burning shame at the thought. God, what a shame. All the neighbours know. Everyone saw Robert go to Julie's house, and everyone saw her with her belly, and then with the babies. And yet these people looked into my eyes, smiled at me, said hello to me, and asked me how I was doing. But they were probably quietly whispering and laughing at me. God, what a fool I was, a blind, naive fool. And my mother-in-law, may she rest in peace, she also knew. She knew and kept silent. She treated me affectionately, behaved as if nothing had happened, and yet she ran to her son's mistress to babysit her long-awaited grandchildren. The information that fell on Connie literally crushed the young woman. She did not know how she would be able to return to the living room and look people, especially her husband, in the eyes. It was unbearable. Did I deserve this? Haven't I suffered enough? I have become a laughing stock. Connie entered the kitchen and put the dirty plates she had in her hands into the sink. Paying no attention to Mrs. Goncalves and Mrs. Basie, quickly they stopped gossiping. Connie, you must be tired, my dear. Sit down and rest. I'll wash all the dishes myself. Yes, Mrs. Basie added. Rest, you're so tired today. Oh, yes, Connie thought unhappily. I'm really exhausted. She suddenly realised that she couldn't stay in this house for another second. The walls, the atmosphere of the wake, the shadow of the dead mother-in-law, the betrayal of her husband, and the all-knowing neighbours. She wanted to crawl into her house, hide from everyone, and cry out her pain. For a second, the thought flashed into her mind to go into Julie's house, to look into the eyes of that false prude, and at the same time, to look at Robert's children, to see whether they really resembled him, as the neighbours said. But Connie immediately rejected the idea, afraid that when she looked at the faces of the little ones, her heart would immediately burst with grief into a million pieces. She straightened up and entered the living room, where the memorial meal was going on. At the sight of her, Robert perked up. "'Connie, where have you been?' he asked pitifully. "'Sit down. Sit with me. I'm empty and cold without you.' For a few moments, Connie stared inquisitively into his eyes, trying to understand, "'How is this possible? How is it possible to look into the eyes of your wife, assure her that it's bad without her, and a few hours later look into the eyes of your mistress?' kissing her, hugging her, burying your lips in the sweet-smelling tops of your children's heads? She'd never realised Robert was such a duplicitous person. God, how she hated him at that moment. 
she wanted to claw at his face with her nails, and scratch him bloody, to spit into his shameless eyes, to scream, Why are you doing this to me? Of course, Connie did not do any of that. She only nodded coldly at him, and smiled demurely. Sorry, Robert, I'll probably go home, she said in an even voice. I'm terribly tired and exhausted. I have a headache. I want to take a pill and lie in silence. You'll manage without me, won't you? Yes, Robert nodded confusedly. Yes, of course. Rest, don't worry about anything. The neighbours will help with everything here. Especially one neighbour, Connie thought with bitter irony, but said, in other words, You can sleep here tonight if you want. With your mistress and children, she'll be glad. She finished mentally. But her husband shook his head fearfully. No, no, I don't want to be here. I want to be with you. I'll definitely come home tonight. You should have come back earlier, Connie thought bitterly. Now it's too late. It won't change or fix anything anyway. Well, in any case, she still had time to be alone, to recover a little and think things over. She had to decide how to proceed, how to live on. Once home, Connie finally let her tears flow. They rolled and rolled down her cheeks, not wanting to stop, and Connie cried inconsolably for an hour. She felt like an unnecessary, discarded thing, which her husband used and threw away without regret, replacing it with another, newer one. Although he hadn't even thrown her away yet, Robert was still maintaining the visibility that he and Connie were a family, but she knew it was all an illusion, a lie. Connie realised that Julie was far from stupid. It was unlikely that she would openly tell Robert to leave his wife and move in with her and his children, but Connie also realised that sooner or later Robert would inevitably think about leaving. What does he have on one side of the scale? A wife, familiar in every detail, not too young and barren and on the other side, a young, beautiful mother of his children. Robert's leaving was a matter of time. So after much agonising deliberation, Connie made a difficult, but as it seemed to her, the only right decision. She must free Robert and untie his hands. Connie was going to wait for him to leave her, but she decided to leave on her own. In a matter of minutes, she threw her things into a suitcase. Fearing to be caught unawares, Connie hurriedly scribbled a farewell note to her husband, before leaving the apartment where she and Robert had lived for so many happy years. Connie lingered on the threshold and looked back. There was a pinch in her chest, and a bitter lump rolled down her throat. Taking a deep breath, the woman pushed open the door. She had no idea where to go now, planning to spend the night in some hotel, and then— and then she would see. Maybe she'd go to her parents or a friend's apartment. But she couldn't go to them. Robert would look for her there first, and she didn't want him to find her. Not now, anyway. Her wound was too fresh for Connie to be able to look her almost ex-husband in the eye. Some day they would talk, and perhaps she would even try to understand him, but not now. When Robert finally came home five hours later, he found an empty apartment and a note on the kitchen table. I know about you and Julie, and about your children too. You and I should break up, there's no other way out. Please, Robert, don't try to contact me. I'm not ready to see you yet. Don't torture yourself or me. I'll file for divorce myself and you'll get the notice. I sincerely wish you happiness in your new family. Not yours any more. Connie. Three years later. All this time, Connie was quite a self-sufficient person. She was almost never bored alone. She easily found something to do. Read a book, go for a walk, go to the theatre or cinema, or go to a cosy coffee shop to drink a cup of her favourite cappuccino. She did not hesitate to do it alone, although many of her acquaintances embarrassedly admitted that they were uncomfortable going to public places without company. If you come to the theatre or a restaurant alone, 
They may think that you do not need anyone at all, her colleague Bella once told her. What a silly thing to say, Connie was indignant. I go alone because I'm not bored alone. Who cares if I have company or not? These are outdated notions. And yet these notions work, Bella objected with conviction. If, for example, you come to the bar in the company of girlfriends or alone, most likely men will pay attention to the company and not to a single girl. That's really nonsense, Connie snorted. Besides, maybe I don't want men paying attention to me. Maybe I just came to the bar to have a drink and have fun after a hard day. Oh, you're being sly, Connie, Bella said, squinting her eyes. Every woman wants to find Mr. Wright. No one wants to be alone. Connie said tiredly, You and I are speaking different languages. I'm afraid you'll never understand me. In fact, of course, Connie didn't make loneliness a priority and didn't make it the purpose and meaning of her life. But she was endlessly annoyed by these outdated but still socially imposed notions. A woman without a man is incomplete. She has to attract someone to make a couple. And even if it's not a good man, it doesn't matter. The main thing is that she is not alone. After her divorce, Connie made several attempts to start a new relationship. She met men at work, on dating sites, at the theatre or in cafes. Sometimes she even went on dates, but they always ended up in failure. It wasn't because the men were bad, but because Connie couldn't help but compare them to her ex-husband Robert, and every time the comparison was not in favour of the new suitors. She couldn't find that same level of compatibility with any other man. Since leaving home three years ago, Robert had repeatedly tried to meet and speak with Connie, but every time she managed to avoid the meetings. I want a divorce and that's it, she would repeat adamantly. I don't need anything else from you. Don't call me, please. Just leave me alone forever. Finally, after losing all hope, Robert gave up and agreed to the divorce. He probably realised that Connie would never forgive him. They met only once more, when they went to get the divorce certificate. Connie avoided looking at her now ex-husband. She was afraid that she might break down, throw herself at him and cry. Robert glanced at her, and after receiving the divorce certificate, made a timid attempt to speak. Connie, he began hesitantly, I miss you. Stop it, she quickly interrupted. Robert, please don't. You and I are divorced. From this day forward, we are strangers. Outsiders. Robert lowered his head, and his gaze faded. As you wish. Be happy. With those words, he walked away, without looking back. For three years, Connie heard nothing about Robert, and didn't make any efforts to find out. However, she had no doubt that Robert was now happy with his new wife and their two children. Connie changed jobs and rented an apartment on the other side of the city to avoid any accidental encounters with the past. However, she couldn't have foreseen that the past would eventually catch up with her. On a gloomy fall day, Connie decided to go shopping to lift her spirits. Lately, she had been feeling irritable and tearful, perhaps due to a seasonal vitamin deficiency, and even her best friend Heather sometimes offended her, saying hurtful things without realising it. For instance, they had been trying to meet up for weeks, but Heather kept postponing and rescheduling the meeting, first from Friday to Saturday, then to Sunday, and so on. Listen, Connie couldn't take it any more. Let's decide. I shouldn't have to cancel my plans every time, and adjust to a time that suits you. What's there to adjust? Heather said it dismissively. You don't have kids. You can go out at any moment. But I need to plan everything, from picking up the kids from kindergarten and school, checking their homework and feeding them. You have no idea how much mothers have to take care of. I can't even imagine. You're right, Conniv confirmed quietly and Heather didn't even realise that she had thoughtlessly blurted out something tactless, inadvertently offending her best friend. 
Walking around the mall, Connie suddenly heard crying and slowed her pace and listened. She turned her head around, trying to locate the source of the sound. Just a few meters away from the food court, a little girl was crying bitterly. She was about three years old. Her blonde curls were disheveled, her pigtails were undone, and her ribbons were helplessly tangled and hanging down. Connie looked around, searching for the girl's parents. No one paid attention to the girl. It was clear she was all alone. Perhaps she had gotten lost. Determined, Connie walked towards the girl and squatted in front of her. Hey, she said tenderly, why are you crying? The girl wiped her tears with her tiny fists, revealing her red wrinkled face. She looked up from under her brow and sobbed. I'm lost! The mall was huge, filled with countless people. It was no wonder the little girl had become confused and frightened. Did you come here with your parents? Connie asked. The girl continued to regard her warily. Daddy says I shouldn't talk to strangers, she finally stated. Your daddy is absolutely right, Connie nodded. So let's get to know each other right away. My name is Connie. What's your name? Amy, the girl replied. Connie couldn't help but smile. So, Amy, what happened? Where are your mum and dad? Didn't you come here with them? No, the girl shook her head. I came here with my daddy and my brother, Marty. All right, so you came here with your dad and brother. Where are they now? Connie continued to ask leading questions. Marty had to use the restroom, the little girl explained innocently. Daddy took him there and told me to wait here. How long have you been waiting? The little girl nodded with a sad sigh. Her face displayed genuine sadness mixed with panic. It's been a while. Maybe they forgot about me and went home? Connie shook her head. I don't think so. How could they forget about such a beautiful and sweet girl like you? I'm sure they'll be back soon. Amy sniffled and immediately brightened up. Your pigtails are loose, Connie said. Why don't you let me fix them for you? The little girl shook her head. Daddy can't braid them properly, she said carefully. He just doesn't know how. Oh, so it's your daddy who does your hair. What about mummy? The little girl looked at Connie with a serious and sad expression. Mommy is dead, she said. Oh, my goodness, Connie gasped. I'm so sorry. I didn't know. The little girl let out a deep sigh. I want Santa Claus to give me and Marty a new mother for my new year. Daddy says it doesn't work that way and that he can only give me a toy, but I hope anyway. She fervently and convincingly added, clasping her hands to her chest. Okay, Connie nodded with a sigh. Let's think about how we can find your daddy. You don't have a cell phone, of course. No, Amy waved her hands. Dad says I'm too young. Well, that makes sense. And you don't know his cell phone number, I assume? The girl shook her head. All right, at least, do you remember your name? I said my name is Amy. The little girl furrowed her brow in frustration, as if annoyed by Connie's lack of understanding. No, I mean in full. First name, last name. Ah, uh, I'm Amy Chase. Connie shuddered involuntarily. It had once been her last name too. And what's your daddy's name? Robert. Connie couldn't believe her ears. Was it a coincidence? How many Robert Chases were there in the world? She gazed inquisitively into the girl's face, trying to catch a glimpse of her ex-husband's features, and was horrified to find them. The same cut of the eyes, the same curve of the eyebrows, the same shape of the nose, and the same pattern of the lips. One had to be blind not to notice the obvious resemblance at first sight. And your brother Marty? Connie asked, in a suddenly grey voice. Is he the same age as you? Yes, Amy nodded proudly. We have a birthday on the same day. We're twins. But as soon as Connie regained her composure, an excited voice sounded nearby. 
a voice she wouldn't mistake for anyone else's. Connie, is it you? Still squatting in front of the little girl, the woman slowly lifted her head and locked eyes with the eyes she could recognize from a million others. Hello, Robert, Connie said softly, standing up. Daddy, I knew you would find me, Amy exclaimed with joy, throwing herself into his arms. Amy, I told you not to leave the bench where Marty and I left you, Robert reproached, his gaze fixed on Connie. The little girl frowned. I got bored. I went to see the aquarium and then I got lost and forgot where my bench was. I tried to find it and got lost. It's not my fault, she pouted playfully. Connie told me you would come, and you did. Robert continued to stare at Connie as if he couldn't get enough of her. She felt uncomfortable under his intense gaze. To conceal her embarrassment, she coughed and spoke softly. Amy told me about Julie. I'm so sorry. Please accept my condolences. Robert responded in a calm, emotionless voice. I'm sorry for the children who are without a mother. But you're also without a wife, Connie hesitantly reminded him. Robert shook his head and spoke slowly, looking directly into Connie's eyes. Julie and I were never married. Connie caught her breath. Why? she asked, although it was none of her business. After all, why did she care why they hadn't got married? Many families simply live like that. The important thing is that he accepted the children. Because I didn't want to marry her, and I never loved her, Robert said firmly. But then how? Connie swallowed a lump in her throat and glanced at the twins, who were already happily chatting and laughing with each other. Robert nervously ran his fingers through his thick hair, ruffling them. Look, this will be a long conversation, he said. I could have explained everything to you back then, but you never wanted to listen. And indeed, three years ago, Connie had refused to hear any explanations. She had simply run away from the cruel and hurtful truth. But enough time had passed, and she wasn't hurting as much any more. Timidly, she nodded to her ex-husband. If you... if you still want to tell me the truth, then I'm ready. Ten minutes later, Amy and Marty were already sitting at one of the food court tables devouring french fries, pizza and nuggets with great gusto, chatting excitedly. Robert and Connie sat at a nearby table. They hadn't ordered any food as they couldn't swallow a bite. So, Robert nervously clenched and unclenched his fingers... Where should I start? Start from the beginning? Connie grinned wryly. When did you and Julie start your relationship? There was no relationship. Robert said it sharply and angrily. There never was. All we had was one single night. It was a drunken mistake and I still regret it. Of course, I don't regret having children, but I'll never forgive myself for sleeping with Julie. I didn't want that. If you didn't want to, then you wouldn't have slept with her. Connie couldn't resist a venomous retort. Without desire, it's purely physiologically impossible. But that night, I thought it was you with me. Connie felt as if she had been stabbed in the chest. Why do you do that to me? She exclaimed. It hurts, Robert. Her ex-husband firmly grasped her palms and squeezed them tightly. But I'm not lying. It's the pure truth. I stayed at my mum's house that night. You went to our apartment. I was so messed up. I wanted to scream and climb the walls out of grief. I decided to get drunk, and I did. I found a sealed bottle of whiskey in the cardboard, opened it, and drank like a beast. I just wanted to fall into a drunken sleep, and then wake up and find that nothing bad had happened, and that my mother's illness was just a bad dream. I did fall asleep for a while, and when I woke up, I found a naked woman's body pressed against me. I thought it was you. Was it Julie? Connie asked, although it was unbearable to hear about this. Julie, Robert nodded. But I only found out in the morning I was too drunk. The room was too dark, and she was silent, not saying a word. She just touched me, 
kissed me and pressed herself against me, all the while not saying anything. I immediately responded to her caresses. I thought I was with you, Connie, he added bitterly. Connie swallowed back the tears that welled up in her throat and quietly asked, How did she... How did she enter the house? She had a spare set of keys. Robert waved it off. Mum left them for her when she went to the sea, and then forgot to take them back. Julie knew I was there, and she also saw that you had left. She took the chance. She came in, saw that I had fallen into a drunken slumber, undressed, and she lay down with me. The rest was a matter of technique. He grinned bitterly. I was waiting for you then, she said with difficulty. I waited all night. I didn't want to go to bed without you. And you were in bed with another woman. Robert pleaded with his eyes as he looked at her. Connie, believe me, when morning came and I finally saw who was lying next to me, I almost lost my mind. I hated myself for it. I was ashamed to look you in the eye. I knew that if you found out you'd never forgive me, especially since you always said that Julie had something for me. And I... I was really a fool, and I didn't believe. Honestly, I was ready to crawl on my knees in front of you, kiss your feet, and beg for forgiveness. It was so scary to tell you what happened. I was trying to find the right moment. In short, I just chickened out, he added in despair. And three weeks later, the radiant Julie informed me that she had taken a pregnancy test, and it was positive. Robert finished weakly, lowering his head. Connie was at a loss for words. The situation before her was entirely different from what she had imagined. The pain of betrayal still lingered, but the circumstances had changed. Robert hadn't intentionally deceived her. It had simply happened. Somehow, she felt certain that her ex-husband was telling the truth, and everything had happened exactly as he had described. Meanwhile, Robert continued his sombre narrative. There could be nothing between us except for that one night. Of course, I wasn't going to abandon my children. I promised to provide financial support and help with their upbringing. I supported Julie during her pregnancy, taking her to doctors, buying medication and vitamins, and helping with the baby's things. She needed a special stroller and a larger crib, it's ironic. I had always dreamed of having children, but it wasn't the woman I loved who gave birth to them. And yet, I still love her, Robert added quietly. Connie lowered her head, trying to hide her tears. And your mother? When did she find out? she asked. Almost immediately, Robert admitted with a sigh. How could Julie hide it? We lived in neighbouring houses. She soon noticed that I was going to see Julie, taking her somewhere and bringing her back. At first she thought I was having an affair. She gave me a hard time. My mum was so fond of you. She was ready to kill me for betraying you. I had to tell her the truth and ask her not to report me. Mum kept saying that you didn't deserve this. Connie remembered. She asked for my forgiveness before she died. Now I understand why. I was a fool. Robert exclaimed, gripping his head with his hands. I should have told you everything myself, instead of waiting for others to spill the truth. That's how it ended up. You found out the truth at my mother's funeral, didn't you? One of the neighbours let it slip, right? It was bound to come out sooner or later. The truth can't be hidden. I kept silent because I was terrified of losing you. And in the end, I lost you anyway. Connie looked at her ex-husband with bitterness her heart filled with pain and pity. God, I loved him so much before. And it appears that this feeling hasn't completely died within me. Yes, Robert is to blame. He bears a lot of responsibility. But I am also at fault. I didn't want to hear his explanation. I just disappeared from his life. Who did I end up hurting? Only myself. And who benefited? No one because Robert never found happiness without her. What happened to Julie? Connie cautiously asked. She was in a car accident, Robert explained briefly. 
She had just gotten her driver's license and wasn't very confident yet. She lost control of the car in the rain. Thank God the kids weren't with her. How old were they at the time? Connie inquired. Barely a year old. They certainly don't remember their mother. As if realising the conversation was about her and Marty, Amy looked at her father and smiled reproachfully. Dad, are we going to get ice cream? You promised. Ice cream will be waiting at home, Robert said firmly, instantly transforming into a caring father. You and Marty should be taking your afternoon nap by now. You'll get your ice cream when you wake up. The girl clapped her hands, then looked at Connie. Can Connie come to us too? the little girl added. Robert stared at his ex-wife as if his fate relied on her answer. We have to ask Connie, he finally croaked. Will you come with us? Amy asked earnestly. Please, we have tasty ice cream at home. Connie finally managed to speak. It depends, she said slowly. Do you have ice cream in a waffle cone at home? It's my favourite, and I can't do without it. Yes, yes, we have it. Daddy loves it too. He always buys it, Amy exclaimed. Well then, Connie smiled, I will happily come to you. That Christmas, little Amy's wish came true. Santa Claus gave her and her brother Marty a new mother. A wonderful, loving and caring mum. Because if you believe strongly enough and truly want something, it will eventually come true. <laughs>